So, hello everybody. I think I will get started uh, with this session. Uh, it will be uh, about energy loss analysis of thin film PV cells. And my name is Guy Bramatz, and I'm a principal scientist at uh, IMO IMOMEC. So IMO IMOMEC, which is a, a research center that works on material research uh, mainly. And it's, it's a research center that's associated both to IMEC and the University of Hasselt and is located physically in uh, Diepenbeek in uh, Belgium, uh, where it is right next to the university. So it's on the university campus. And there we're working on uh, topics like physics, chemistry, engineering. Uh, there's also a packaging center. Uh, and we also have a location at Energyville in Genk. So Energyville, which is a research uh, collaboration between different research centers in Belgium, which are working on renewable energies. So at IMO IMOMEC, we are about uh, 27 professors um, and about 160 co-workers, such as uh, senior scientists, technical staff, postdocs, and PhD students. Um, at IMOMEC, we use material science as a driver for technology innovation. And we are, our, our research programs are based around the two main poles, uh, sustainability and health. Um, and in the sustainability sector, we are working on our energy production and uh, solar cell research that I will uh, present today as part of, of that research uh, center. Uh, and we're also working on energy storage. So that involves mainly battery uh, research. And we're also working on sustainable materials. And in the healthcare uh, sector, we're working mainly on advanced uh, sensing technologies uh, for uh, healthcare. So we are working on four big technology platforms, which are mainly material design, synthesis, and uh, processes to fabricate materials. We are also working on uh, structural, chemical, and physical characterization. And uh, we're working on device physics and engineering, and also analysis of degradation, failure, and reliability. So actually, Energyville uh, is also, or IMO, IMO IMOMEC is also part of Energyville, uh, which is located in Genk on the, on the former mining site, uh, Tor Park where we have uh, recently built a new lab building with where we have now very nice lab infrastructure. Uh, and we are there mainly working on materials for PV systems uh, and batteries and on thin film PV uh, solar cells. So today I'm going to talk about some of the work we do here uh, in Energyville uh, at IMO IMOMEC. Um, on thin film solar cells. Uh, and that work uh, is about the energy loss analysis of thin film solar cells. And that work has actually recently been published in uh, IEEE Journal of Photovoltaics. So if you want to have like a deeper insight of what I'm going to talk about today, you can go and uh, take a look at the paper. Uh, there will be way more information in there. So mainly, we are working on thin film solar cells and modules. And the goal, of course, will be to increase the efficiency. On the one hand, we want to decrease the price because we want to produce electricity at the lowest uh, price possible. But on the other hand, we also want to increase the efficiency because that will uh, increase our energy output per solar cell. So the ultimate goal for the research that we're doing is always to increase the efficiency. So on our solar cell, we typically measure then between the back contact and the front contact, the current. And we can do that uh, either by shining light on it. And that gives the, the red curve on the figure here on the right hand side um, or by, by shining no light on it. That gives the red curve or by shining light on it. That gives the blue curve. And uh, by analyzing this, what we call current voltage curves, so the IV curves, we can determine the efficiency. And we can get some basic idea about the properties of the solar cell, so about the shunt resistance, about the, the series resistance, and about other basic properties of the device. But unfortunately, even though the solar cell is not hugely complicated, it is still a relatively um, complicated device 
consisting of seven different layers. So we have uh, as a back contact the molybdenum metal typically. Then on top of that, a molybdenum selenide layer is naturally formed when we form our absorber. Then we have the CIGS absorber, which is our main active material that absorbs the light and that generates uh, charge carriers, which we are then gonna uh, collect. And then, then there is the cadmium sulfide layer on top of that. And then we have a, a TCO, so a thin conductive oxide, which is very often also consisting of two different materials, um, an intrinsic zinc oxide and an aluminum dope zinc oxide or ITO. So it depends a little bit, uh, different groups use different materials. And on top of that, a grid material. So there is really a sandwich of several layers. Um, and if the efficiency that we measure is not optimal, well, it would be interesting to know why that is so and on which of the seven layers we actually have to work in order to improve the efficiency because the defects uh, that are naturally always present in the solar cells, which are actually gonna degrade the efficiency, uh, they can be at in any of these seven layers and at any of these interfaces between these different layers. So there is a lot of possibilities of having uh, degradation mechanisms there in these solar cells. And we want to analyze uh, how we can reduce these defects uh, in these layers. And one very powerful technique to do that is actually admittance spectroscopy. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, you can also call it CV measurements. So admittance spectroscopy is just a more fancy word for capacitance voltage uh, measurements. Uh, and then what we do is actually exactly the same as for an IV measurement, but instead of putting a uh, current measurement system between the, the back contact and the front contact of the solar cell, we actually put there an LCR meter, which is going to measure uh, the uh, capacitance and the conductance of the device. So we do exactly the same thing as for an IV measurement. So we apply a DC bias voltage between the back contact and the front contact. And we can vary that DC bias voltage and we typically going to use different values varying all the way from minus 1.5 volt to 1 volt. So from full depletion to forward bias. Um, but then on top of that, we have an additional dimension that we can measure, which is actually the frequency of the AC bias voltage that we're going to put on top of that. So on top of the DC bias, we're going to apply a very, very tiny, so an infinitesimal uh, AC bias on top of that DC bias with a very small amplitude, typically 50 millivolt or less. And we're going to give that AC bias a frequency, which we can vary from 100 hertz to 1 megahertz. If you have different, this is with our tool, if you have different tools, you can even vary it from even lower frequencies to even higher frequencies. So that depends on the measurement device you have. And then for every bias voltage and for every frequency, we're gonna measure the capacitance and the conductance of the device. So which leaves us with a huge amount of data. So then we have 2000, so for 50 different bias voltages and for 50 different frequencies, we end up with 2500 different measurement values for the capacitance and the conductance. So that leaves us with a lot of measurement data. So what is exactly the capacitance that we are gonna measure uh, of our devices that is mainly so to first order the capacitance of the depletion region of the PN junction, because our thin film solar cell is like most solar cells, uh, nothing else than a PN junction. So we have an, uh, a P-type doped semiconductor bound together with an N-type doped semiconductor. Um, and then when you put these two together, the, the electrons from the one layer uh, recombine with the holes from the other layer and they form a depletion region in the middle, which is a region where there is no mobile chargers, but only fixed chargers. So in the P-type layer, which is in our case, uh, the, the CIGS um, here, so we get negative charges in the depletion region. And in the N-type layer, which is, is in our case, the cat sulfide, we get positive charges at this position. So here we actually have nothing else than a capacitance. So we have negative charges separated from positive charges. So that is what is the definition of a capacitance. And the value of that capacitance will actually change when we change the bias voltage of the device. Um, so when we change the bias voltage, if we go 
to more negative bias voltages, the depletion region will become larger, the capacitance uh, will uh, decrease, and the other way around if we go to forward bias. So that, that is basically to first order what we do, but then what actually happens when you have defects in your device? Well, then we get actually a frequency dependency because this all does not depend on the frequency because the defect atoms in the semiconductor, they are very shallow and they can respond to very, very high frequencies. They can respond to low frequencies. So the capacitance that we're gonna measure is totally independent of frequency. So there's no frequency dependency. So then what is the interest of having a frequency dependency? And that's exactly where the defects come into play. So when we now introduce defects in a layer and I have represented them here as the red line, that you see here in the CIGS layer. So here I have added bulk defects in the CIGS. Well, these defects, they typically show up as energy states within the band gap of the semiconductor. So within the forbidden band of the semiconductor, there is normally no electronic states. So charges, electrons and holes are not allowed to go to these energy levels. But if we have defects, in our solar cells, then there will be energy levels within the band gap. And these energy levels typically act as very strong recombination centers and they degrade the efficiency of the solar cell. And it's exactly those ones that we want to eliminate uh, in our solar cells in order to increase the efficiency. And actually it happens, and that has been calculated a long, long time ago by Shockley, Reed and Hall. And that was the foundation of all the transistors and all the PCs and on all the semiconductor industry that we have uh, these days. Uh, so they have calculated that actually the, the time that it takes for an electron to come out of such an uh, a defect state within the band gap of the semiconductor depends on the one hand on the depth of the energy level so the distance and energy between the defect energy and the valence band or the conduction band of the semiconductor. Uh, so it's here represented with the uh, purple delta E. So that's the energy depth. So it's the difference in energy between the defect and the valence band in this case. And it also depends on the capture cross section, which is the, the sigma. So here you see the relation, which gives the time uh, that it takes for the electron to come out of such a defect level and it depends on the depth of the level and on the capture cross-section. So you can imagine it as like a big hole in the ground uh, and the depth of the hole is represented by the energy depth of the defect level and the capture cross-section is like the size of the hole and the time that it takes to get out of this hole is actually dependent on the depth. So the deeper the hole will be the more time it will take to get out and also on the size of the hole. So the, the, the larger the hole is, the more probable it is that, that my electron will fall in there. And also it will take more time to get out because it's, it's such a big hole. Um, and then what happens in our capacitance measurement if we have such a defect? Well, if the measurement frequency is now slower than the natural frequency of that defect, so the time can be translated uh, into a, a frequency by taking the inverse of the time. So, and if our me measurement frequency is lower than the natural response frequency of the defect, then actually the electrons can go in and out of that defect and the static charge of the defect will add up to the capacitance. So we will get a larger capacitance than if there would not have been a defect. Now, what happens if the frequency is larger, the measurement frequency is larger than the natural response frequency of that defect. Well, in that case, the, uh, the defect cannot follow the measurement frequency because the AC voltage will vary way faster uh, than the defect can respond. And in that case, we will not see the capacitance of the defect. So actually the consequence is that at the natural response frequency of the defect, we get a step in the capacitance response of the measurement signal. Um, and that's what we see in the next slide. So here I have an example of a measurement on a certain solar cell device. And then we see that below a frequency of about 2, 10 to the power 5 hertz, uh, we see that the capacitance is more or less constant. And then all of a sudden it starts to drop. And unfortunately, I don't see the plateau at higher frequencies because I cannot measure at higher frequencies than 10 to the power 6. But here 
uh, at, at higher frequencies, it would go to a plateau again, and then we have a constant frequency again. But at the energy, at, real, at the natural energy of the defect, we have a step in the capacitance, and then we can go and measure that and analyze it and get an idea about the defect and where they are positioned in the energy level uh, of our, of our uh, solar cell. Now, it's not so nice to look at steps in the capacitance. So what we generally do is we take the derivative of the capacitance and then we get actually peaks at the position where there is a step. So here you see the same data, but we have just on the right-hand side, you see the same data as on the left-hand side, except that we have taken the derivative of the curve. And then we get like a peak at the position of the, the step. So here there is a capacitance step and that is translated into a peak in this derivative curve. So it's generally easier to analyze these curves. And this technique is, is very, very powerful and it's used a lot in the literature. So people are using that for all type of solar cells and there is a lot of papers on this. So I've show, I'm showing here only a selection of papers. Um, and, 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 but what all of these papers have in common is that they're hugely complicated. The figures in there consist of many lines where different lines can be different temperatures because you can do the analysis as a function of temperature. You can do the analysis as a function of bias voltage because the bias voltage will determine the position of the Fermi level and that will determine which defect you're going to cross and which defect you're actually going to measure. And all that is really complicated but very powerful. So uh, there is a lot of analysis that can be done and all these people here in these papers are uh, very much experts in their field and they in their in this field and they have spent years uh, trying to get uh, to to get to know everything about this uh, frequency and uh, bias response of these different admittance measurements um, but you know for the general researcher it's nothing that you just do like in an afternoon so it's really something where you have to get a lot of experience in so what we are trying here in, in our work is actually to make this a little bit easier. And as a first step, uh, you can see here the output of a typical measurement uh, where we measured the capacitance and the conductance for 50 different frequencies and for 50 different bias voltages. And it's a lot of lines. So every line corresponds to a certain bias voltage. So DC bias voltage of the device. And in the bottom, we have the different frequencies that we measured. And then we get peaks. We get a lot of lines. They're overlapping. So it's a little bit chaotic. We can get a lot of information out of this, but you have to be a real expert. And you have to have a lot of experience to really uh, get all the information out of this. So a first step that we, that we do here is actually to plot this data in a somewhat nicer, more graphical fashion. And we just make contour plots. So this is exactly the same data as on the previous slide, except that we have now plotted this as a, as a contour plot. So on the vertical axis, you now see the, 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 the derivative of the capacitance. And on the vertical, so on the on the z axis, so that the ones that comes out of the screen, that's the derivative of the capacitance. The um, the y axis is actually the logarithm of the frequency, so of the measurement frequency, and the horizontal axis is here the bias voltage. And then you can see that it's a way better graphical representation of the data. So you can now see that the, you have uh, response domains which are uh, actually together. So uh, if you so you, you see that here there is at about 0 0.5 volts and at 100 kilohertz there is a big peak so you have a certain defect but actually that peak has also a tail which is going to uh, negative bias voltages but staying at the same frequency but all this is, is probably related to the to the same defect you have a big island in this corner which is something else it's probably not related to the other defect so you see graphically that there is different events happening in your device and it's it's a, it's a nice way of plotting the data so that's the first step but then we still have no clue what this defect could be because it could still be anywhere in our device in any of the seven layers at any of the interfaces so we really don't know so the next logical step uh, would be then to actually go and make simulations and that's what we have done in this work so we have taken uh, the um, the software 
uh, that was developed at the University of Ghent by uh, Mark Bergelman, uh, which is called SCAPS. And in that software, we can actually simulate the capacitance of the solar cell. So we just introduce all the layers, the CIGS, the CAT sulfide, all the TCOs. And then we position defects at different positions in the device. So we can add bulk defects in the CIGS. We can add a defect at the backside barrier. We can add defects at the cat sulfide interface. We can add defects at the interface between the cat sulfide and the zinc oxide. And then we can add defects inside the zinc oxide. And we can simulate all that and see how it looks like on our uh, on our map. Um, and that's what we have done. So first, if you don't put any defects at all, you just get a map which is totally empty, which is logical because there's no defect, so there is no no losses, so no uh, capacitance steps. Um, but then when you start to introduce some defects, you, you can get uh, different responses. And that's what we have uh, looked into. So for the shunt resistance, it actually has no influence on the, on the defect map. Um, but it has some influence on the way that the tool can measure. Because if the shunt resistance is too low, then actually the DC currents that are flowing through the device are too large and the tool can just not measure the capacitance correctly anymore. And we can usually measure that with the dissipation factor. And the dissipation factor, which is plotted here, is actually showing that in this domain, when you're in forward bias, the currents are just too high. Um, and uh, that actually leads to this large blob. So this large blob that we see in our map is actually due to nothing else than the shunt resistance. If we have a series resistance uh, in our device, so a too large resistance in series with the with the PN junction, then we see that actually depending on the value of the series resistance, we get different responses in our map. And actually, the higher the series resistance, the lower this response will 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 go. And we can see here that it moves when we have typical values of one ohm square centimeter from a frequency of about one megahertz down to five. Uh, uh, 500 kilohertz when we have a resistance of 100 ohm square centimeter and down to 10 kilohertz when we're at super high resistances like 1000 ohm square centimeters. So, and it's actually a response which is totally independent of the uh, bias voltage. So, there is no bias voltage dependency. So, if we see something like that, then we know, well, it's likely series resistance. So, it's uh, that's what that's what we're looking at. Um, if we put a bulk defect in the CIGS, we actually get a response that looks like this. And it just happens that this actually is looking like what we have seen on the measurement that we had earlier. Uh, so here we have like a peak somewhere at positive bias voltages, but there is also a tail that is extending to low bias voltages. And it's all happening at more or less the same frequency. And the frequency actually gives an idea about the depth of the defect inside the band gap. So I have put here different depth of the defect inside the band gap. So if it's 0 0.3 electron volt deep, then it happens at around one megahertz. If you go to 0 0.4 electron volt, it happens at 10 kilohertz. If you go to 0 0.5, it happens at uh, 100 hertz. And if it's even deeper, it, you actually don't see it anymore because it's happening at so low frequencies that it's out of the measurement range of the tool. Um, we can put defects at the CIGS cat sulfide interface. And then actually we see that the defects show up also at different frequencies. And depending on the depth, uh, we can go from high frequency to low frequency, but it's actually all very localized at a single bias voltage now. So here we, we get a response that is actually only happening in forward bias. So around the value of the VIC of the VOC of the device, then we get a, a response here in the loss map. So we can see visually that this is a completely different response than compared to the bulk defects in this case. So when we analyze the loss map just by looking at it, so you don't even have to be an expert in the field, just by looking at the map, you see, oh, well, you just go to uh, the, the simulations and you compare it to the simulations and you see, well, this, this must be uh, an interface defect because only the interface defect has such a localized response at one certain bias voltage. So that's actually very helpful when you want to analyze the, the, the data and want to know where the defects are and which layer you actually have to work on to improve your efficiency. 
Uh, here we simulated a barrier at the back, back contact, and then we see that uh, we only get a response in a certain bias region. And then there's actually this slight upward tail, which is indicating, which is typical for this uh, backside barrier. Uh, so you could also just visually, by looking at the graph, uh, look at the data. Uh, we also put a barrier at the CIGS cat sulfide interface, and then we get this fully horizontal uh, response, which looks a lot like a bulk defect. So it's it's kind of difficult to separate a bulk defect from a barrier at the CIGS cat sulfide interface because they have quite similar responses in the in the loss map that we are analyzing. And then finally, when you have different defects all happening simultaneously as at, in the solar cell, because you don't have just one defect, but you could have like a serous resistance plus an interface defect and a bulk defect. Well, they just happen to add up in the defect map. So here I have made a simulation uh, where I added a serous resistance and an interface defect and a bulk defect. And when you look at the, uh, the, the, the map, the CV map um, of the total device, you just see that all the three defects just happen at the same time and they just add up. So what we're currently working on is where we're measuring a lot of the devices and then we're trying to uh, compare the measurement results that we get with the simulations that we did. So here what you see is different measurements that we did on CIGS devices, castorite devices, silicon devices, perovskite devices, you name it. So all, all type of PN junctions can be measured and that's what we're currently doing and we're trying to compare it to the library of uh, defects that we have made and try to see if there is any responses that look similar uh, to what we actually simulated. Uh, actually, we're also working on PL and time resolved PL, which is another very, um, very strong method to analyze defects in solar cell, but that is a, a different topic. So we just submitted a paper in Journal of Applied Physics. So I will not go into defect, but I just wanted to mention that we are also uh, looking into that. And then to conclude, uh, is I just want to say that we introduced the CVF loss maps, uh, which is a very nice graphical representation uh, of the admittance spectroscopy, which normally is quite complicated. And then we made simulations to try to make a library of different defects in order to try to identify the position of the defect in the devices in order to be able to uh, faster solve problems that we would have in our solar cells. Um, so. If you have any questions, there is still a, a few minutes uh, for questions. So you can put them uh, either in the chat on the right or you can put them in the Q&A uh, window. So I don't see any questions quite yet, but if somebody has one, I am uh, open for uh, questions. So I know that this admittance spectroscopy uh, method is, is really something for experts in the field. It is very, very uh, complicated, um, but we try to, to make it a little bit more accessible to, to everybody because it is such a powerful method and it can give you a lot of information about uh, the solar cells and why exactly they are not performing as you would wish them to perform. Um, so this is a, a first step. Uh, we're still working on it, but I think we, we, we have made a big step and we were, we're trying to understand all these big uh, chunks of data um, much better. Uh, during a GV scan, no, because it's a different tool. So what, what the, the way the capacitance is measurement uh, is measured is typically that you apply the DC bias or the AC bias and you just measure the current that flows in the device and actually the out of phase response of the current with the voltage is the capacitance and the in phase response is the conductance. So it's really a, a dedicated instrument that you need. So you will need an LCR meter. So we usually have to disconnect our IV curve tracer and then we connect the probes to the LCR meter which is standing right below it. Um, but it, it's not being done in one tool. So it's really different type of tools. Uh, yes, everything has to be done as a function of temperature uh, as well. So uh, in order to get the capture cross section and the real, because the, 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 the frequency depends on both the energy depth and the capture cross section. So uh, you 
cannot know both if you don't look at the dependency on temperature. So then you have to do Arrhenius plots. And, and you can also, of course, look at the signature at different temperatures. We have not simulated that yet, but that's definitely also something we want to do. But SCAPS seems to be a little bit unstable at low temperatures. So definitely at cryogenic temperatures, so it's more complicated, but we are also working on that. Um, um, SCAPS is available for the general public. Yes, you can just download it. Um, just Google SCAPS, and then you will end up at the personal web page of Mark Bergelmans. I think he's still in charge of that, and you can, I think you have to send him a mail saying that you, you're going to use it, um, but you can just freely download it. And he, he mainly asks that you reference him, uh, yet that you cite him if you ever want to use it in a publication. So that's, I think, typically anything he wants to uh, from you. Uh, about the PL curve, if it's on a complete solar cell, only for absorber layer. Um, you can do it on both, but it will not be the same if you do it on just the absorber or on the solar cell, because in one case, the top surface will not be passivated. In the other case, you will have a PN junction, which will act on the charge uh, dynamics. So it's not the exact same thing, but it can be done on both. The more stable one is the one on the full solar cell, because um, the top surface will not oxidize anymore, so it's a little bit more stable. Uh, SCAPS can be used, I don't know if it can be used for silicon. I would guess yes. I don't see any reason why not. I'm not sure if, you, if, if it works also for indirect band gap materials, but I assume so. It would be a really easy thing to do, so I would guess that he has done that. And the thicknesses you can put in scaps are really up to you. Yes, so the, the, there is a big influence of light. So if you shine light on it, so admittance is always done in the dark. You can also do it in, in, in light, but then it gets really out of hand. So uh, I, I don't want to start with that. So in the dark, it's already very complicated. But when you start to shine light on it, that the, the light will also uh, add an additional light bias. So it will separate the... Uh, um, the electron Fermi level and the whole Fermi level, and you will get effects due to the light. So it will get even more complicated. So it can be done, but I'm, I haven't started on that. It's, it's way more complicated. Yeah, so if you have multiple types of defects, they will overlap in the admittance map. So they will indeed get more complicated, You but you will see different uh domains which can be overlapping or cannot it depends on really the energy depth of the different different levels but they will all appear on the same map so that's actually this slide that i've shown here so here you have three individual defects that you can simulate individually but if you have them all three at the same time in the device you will see that they appear on the map all three at the same time and then they're overlapping partly partly overlapping, partly not overlapping, but they will all three uh, appear. And this is true as long as there's no Fermi level pinning, because as soon as you introduce Fermi level pinning, then actually that ca could hide some of the defects. So it, it's it's still complicated, but um, so yeah, more defects makes it more complicated, yes. But you will you will see different defects because they will appear on this this map in different regions normally unless you're unlucky and they all overlap that could happen of course but typically not okay I think the next session's already started so uh, thank you uh, for your participation. Um, I will still stay for a few minutes, so if you have more questions, uh, go ahead. Well, yeah, if it's if it's identified, so if you know that it's an interface defect and it's at the cat sulfide uh, CIGS interface, for example, at least you know what process you have to work on. So it will not matter much to uh, work on the back contact if you have identified here that the defect is between the CIGS and the cat sulfide. So if, if it's between the CIGS and the cat sulfide, then I would start to work on the cat sulfide deposition process or maybe do a little cleaning after the CIGS deposition before you do the cat sulfide deposition or work, work on that or, or actually even use a different material.
Uh, of course, cat sulfide works nicely, but there is other options these days, like zinc oxysulfide, and maybe that works better. So there is the, 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 you, you know where you have to work on then. Um, defect distribution in energy. Yes, the, the, so the, the defects are typically distributed in energy. So here you see uh, an, an example of, of a defect where it's, it's distributed in energy a lot. So you have a, a trace actually over all frequencies. So that's actually a certain distribution in energy. And you can add energy distributions in SCEPs. So you could go to SCEPs and try to simulate that and try to uh, get like a, the same type of distribution. This is, this is likely uh, some sort of interface defect which has a certain energy, broad energy distribution. Um, because it's it's quite localized around these bias voltages, but still it it runs over all the frequencies. So this is very likely that it's some some sort of interface defect uh, with a very broad energy distribution. So that's also something you can see on the on the map. I have made the presentation downloadable because everything has been published, so there is no secret information. So you can actually download it if you want to. Uh, I don't know exactly where there is a button, but it should be possible somehow, I guess. Oh, yes, D DLTS is also very useful. There is uh, also many experts in that field. I'm personally not an expert for DLTS. It's very similar to admittance spectroscopy, but still slightly different, so which makes the analysis uh, again slightly different. So I'm not really expert in DLTS, but it, it gives the same type of information as admittance spe spectroscopy clearly. So it's, it's definitely also useful. Um, I'm not sure about the bias dependency. So here we, we can analyze the bias dependency, of course. I'm not sure in DLTS if you can also apply a DC bias because you do that capacitance uh, peak. I'm, I'm not fully sure exactly. I'm not expert in DLTS. But it's definitely very related and kind of similar. Okay, thank you. So have fun at the other sessions. And